Welcome back to the show. I'm Dan Shaheen. Today we're going to talk about some recent DC comics, including Superman in the wake of the reveal of Superman's true secret identity. Uh, Action Comics 1019. Batman 87, the second issue of the new creative team since the departure of Tom King. And finally, Wonder Woman 750, a milestone anniversary issue. Uh, let's talk about this and just the state of DC Comics in general today on Comic Book News. Hey, welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about some recent DC Comics. Uh, they've, you know, in all the years, they're try since the uh, success of Action Comics 1000 and Detective... Uh, anniversary issues. They've decided to go that way on Wonder Woman, treat her as one of their core legacy characters, and uh, renumber starting with number 750. So this is a giant-sized, overpriced anniversary issue with a bunch of variant covers. I ha uh, uh, The covers uh, explore the different decades of Wonder Woman. Here I've got my favorite of the covers was uh, had to be the Brian Boland cover, um, although the Adam Hughes cover was tempting uh, we're also going to talk about superman number 19 first issue of superman since his secret identity was revealed in the previous issue how is that tying in with action comics 1019 two comics about the same character in, during the same time period written by the same writer that just feel completely disconnected from each other so we'll talk about that a tiny bit um and we'll talk about Batman 87, the second in the uh, Tinian run on Batman in the wake of Tom King's controversial run. Is it any good? You know what? Why would I tell you here when we paid a million dollars for a million dollar comics cam? So, exactly. You know what I mean? You spend a million dollars, you want to get some value out of it. So, what should we talk about first? We're not going to go through these in depth. My new format here is a little bit more of a digest kind of format. Let's talk, uh, let's start with Batman, okay? Because, as I said, the first issue, uh, 86, the previous issue, had beautiful Tony Daniels artwork. This one does not. This one <laughs> also features, this is a... Gillum March is the artist. Not a super big fan. I mean, it's not terrible. It's competent. Storytelling's okay. The rendering choices are not my favorite. Some of these layouts and stuff, um, not not great. A little bit amateurish, especially. I mean, if you're going to compare it to Tony Daniels in the previous issue, the story is just as dumb, if not dumber. Except we're going to bring in, you know, a classic character, one of my favorite villains, the Riddler. And try, and I just don't know what they've done to the Riddler. He used to be like the smartest guy, the coolest customer. My favorite versions of the Riddler would probably be the version from Batman the Animated Series is probably my all-time favorite, followed by maybe Frank Gorshin in the uh, 66 TV series, um, followed by anything else. I always like the idea of the Riddler as just a guy whose his sole motivation is just to prove that he's smarter than Batman. That's all he really cares about. Um, so, you know, what we get here is a pretty mediocre Batman comic. Um, trying to carry on with this concept of the five assassins from the last issue. Now they're locked up in Batman's super secret prison. And it just features some things that are pretty ridiculous. Like, I don't know anything about I don't know much about Cheshire. She's poison, but it's, she's got poison. That's her shtick, right? But in this, she gets smashed by a semi-truck. And not only lives, but like is conscious. So does she have superhuman powers? Anybody know? Speak up in the comments. The other thing I want to notice, I've been noticing in a lot of these issues, these DC issues, and we'll talk about more as we go through, is you're going to see a lot of these ads for this new DC graphic novel line right and they're kind of like smaller sized and they're aimed at kids and the whole series of writers and artists we've never heard of before um, obviously going on off of the success of scholastic and reina telgemeier and uh dave pilkey's dog man and all that stuff that are selling in that kind of format that's the format that's selling full color kind of digest sized 
thick graphic novels for like eight bucks. It's a super great value. Here's another one. I mean, that's what all of the ads now in the comics are pivoting towards. And it's so obvious DC is moving, tacking in that direction. And I say good for them. But then when the kids graduate from those and they want to read a good Batman book, I, I hope this is not the Batman book that they pick up. And the, uh, some of you out there are going to say, well, it sure shouldn't be the Tom King book. And maybe that's true. I don't know. I don't know what the right entry level Batman book is. Maybe that's the beauty of Batman is the character works in so many different iterations. There's a Batman for everybody. But what did I think? I thought that the stuff that came out in Walmart of Batman really, lately, actually the, the Bendis stuff that was collecting those big Walmart digests and then came out as, I forget what it was called, but I reviewed the first issue here. I'll, I'll check into that. Anyway, that story was a pretty good like entry level story that was way better drawn anyway and and a lot better written than this this is stinky i don't think i'm reading batman anymore okay let's talk about superman and action comics for a second so these are two comics it's the same character during the same exact same time period written by the same writer but they feel like holy separate books and that's i guess that's by design i'm not exactly sure what the theme like action comics seems to be more about action i guess and more um less about like the personal life of superman and more about just the rock'em sock'em action life of superman so i guess you could read that if that's all you cared about and it, it is obviously tied in and connected i mean superman just revealed his his secret identity and that plays in majorly into this issue of action comics and of course into this but in Superman, it's more like this is more of a we're going to gently explore. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that Batman issue. It doesn't, I don't need to look at that again. You know, we're going to explore some of the ramifications of him revealing uh, his identity, uh, loving the, uh, the uh, Ivan Rice artwork. The guy's good, you know human real human emotions and characters and 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 then eventually when we get to some some action we get some solid action in this book because there's only so much hugging and clapping that we can take in a superman comic before he's got to punch somebody right and so we've got a lot of celebrating everybody's you know i guess there's mixed emotions maybe about revealing his secret identity amongst the leaguers but everybody's like celebrating we're like yeah go we're glad man we love you um then meanwhile, there's the whole storyline of the United Planets, basically like the Legion of the Future started today when Superboy founded it, but then immediately left and went to the future to be with them for whatever reason. We know the reason to set up that, that the stage for that comic. And uh, but so now we've had enough of this. So we're, now we're going to get an attack of Mong Mongol, right? Let's go back to basics. Superman, you know, we just had Rogel Czar, who was basically like nothing but Mongol in, with a different look and a Kryptonian connection, in my opinion. Mongol's always been sort of a fairly generic Superman villain, in my opinion. I mean, he's really powerful, I guess, um, but never been that interesting. Again, here's another one of those all-ages DC books. We can see where DC's moving. And again, smart move if you want to plan for the future. But let's make sure that we have something for every step of the way right let's get the young all ages one let's have a, like a superman comic for like t t you know teenage tw 12 year old 11 year old tween readers then let's get them into the graphic novels of the more mature type stuff anyway rant off okay here's ivan rice showing you know he'll do great superman action we get a we get a, just a slug fest between these united planet dudes and mongol and mongol super contemptuous these guys are from Tamaran, right? And they're like, for Tamaran. And he's like, for what now? He yelling that he's from Tamaran like it's an achievement to be proud of? I like that. Um, but so he's having none of it. He's like, look, you wanted to be united. I offered you to be united. You could be united under my rule. So you guys are hypocrites by wanting to unite. I don't know. It's a goofy excuse for a Mongol attack, I guess. But... Um, what the heck? I like it, it's fun. This is what we want in a fun Superman comic. Giant dinosaur things, Tamaranians and you know, battling Mongol, I guess. 
great battle. Mongol, I mean, does prove he's a super tough guy, I guess, in this, and he is really beating the crap out of Superman. Like, unity? You want unity? You want unity? You guys are hypocrites. And he just beat the crap out of Superman in front of him, and that's what he said. He's like, I'm here to beat you up in front of these guys to demoralize them, or whatever it is. Oh, another all-ages DC di pocket digest size books in bookstores soon? It's happening, guys. All right, so that was Superman. But meanwhile, over in Superman, so he's having his giant slugfest battle with Mongol. By the way, in the in the middle of, of wherever. And we get to action comics, and now we're going to see what's... Up. Meanwhile, the entire Legion of Doom have teamed up with Leviathan from the event leviathan and they even reference they're like i was really like that was a really awesome event leviathan that you pulled off like who called it event leviathan wouldn't you call it like the, a leviathan event or something like it didn't make any sense to me like the the whole leviathan thing i think would have been great if it was one or two issues in action comics which is what it should have been instead they stretched they literally took what was supposed to take place in like 24 hours or 48 hours and stretched it out into a six issue miniseries that had no satisfying beginning or conclusion and just led to us to where we are. Overextension, it cost too much, too little going on in all those issues, too decompressed, um, even for Bendis, especially like it wasn't good. Anyway, why am I still reading it? I actually have been enjoying action comics and I even kind of like the Leviathan thing a little bit. Like I said, if it was just tighter and didn't wasn't drawn out for six whole months, for the reveal, I would have been way, way, way more on board with what they're laying down. So Leviathan reveals basically to the to the Legion of Doom, who have been in this whole Villains United thing going on that we'll talk about in a minute that nobody really cares about, or do they? And he reveals, you know, Leviathan's got all this technology from all the Argus agents and all these different sources that they that Leviathan absorbed. And uh, they've got this secret paradise city place that they're all living in that they can transport to. And this is obviously like plays into Luther's plans. He's like, oh, this is the missing piece. And and. Meanwhile, we cut back to present day. I forgot to say, of course, like any Bendis battle, this is like starts out in the middle of a battle. We don't know where it even be came from. And we're going back and forth now. What we've just been seeing is the like what led up to this battle that we're seeing, this epic battle of the Justice League. And everybody's been beaten except Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman against the final, you know, Brainiac, Luther, and whoever's left here. And Jimmy Olsen's taking a picture and they're hashtagging it. The Schuster's Park battle. And all right, it's a pretty decent slugfest, I guess. John Romita Jr. artwork, we've talked about him a lot on here. I like, he's a good storyteller and everything else, but for this type of action and stuff, I would have rather seen Ivan Rice, who we just looked at, drawing it. And we get a little peek more, back more into the origin of the Red Cloud, a.k.a. Robinson Good. This is a character who now we've been watching for more than a year, who it's been pretty much implied she had figured out or almost figured out Clark Kent was Superman and was sort of either sitting on that or just couldn't believe it herself and then the big reveal was made and now we're going sort of like um, back to her now she is joined up She's she works at the Daily Planet she's the uh, uh, gossip reporter I guess and but she secretly works for Leone, Miss Leone, who owns the planet, but is also the head of the secret mafia of, um, of, of Metropolis. And so she's now joined up with Leviathan and the Legion of Doom, another all ages type young aimed at girls DC book here. Um, and they say, look, we're going to kill Superman and you're going to be the one to do it. And she's like, I can't do it. I could kind of, I went toe to toe with him and I stopped him and they're pumping her up. They're like, oh yeah, if you stopped her, if we soften her up, soften Superman up, you can be the one that kills him. 
And and they start talking about where can we fight where Superman won't be able to totally let loose. And she says, "What's the where is the one place where he never fights back all the way?" And she says, "We're standing in it." And I guess that's implying Metropolis itself. So if they engage him in Metropolis, he won't be able to let loose. Sort of an allusion maybe to the Superman movies where he fought um, Zod and you know, basically everyone's like a so out of character because all the people that would have died. Interesting that they're addressing it. The only reason I'm reading this is that I'm actually still kind of enjoy the way he writes action comics. Uh, I like Bendis despite his his failings. When he's on, he's on. When he writes this sort of crime stuff and from the criminal's point of view, I enjoy. I still enjoy it. So I'm keeping up with action and Superman comics. I'm going to talk about it more on the channel. Bendis, I'm, I'm still in, but buddy but you've got to like rein in your decompression and give us a little bit more story bang for the buck um and i feel like maybe you're starting to get that message okay let's go to wonder woman 750 big glossy one it's got all these it's got various variant covers um it's 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 got multiple stories many of which tie into the current wonder woman continuity which i know nothing about and some of them have sort of subpar or okay artwork at best. But there's a couple gems in here. So we'll look at it. Some of these stories, meh. Didn't care too much about this saga with Cheetah. They're obviously doing playing up Cheetah a lot because I think she's going to be involved in the next movie heavily. So they're trying to make her a major player, which I guess she has been. And the silencer character. There's some really dumb stuff in this first story. I think it's really lame. And their god killer sword. But I was intrigued because I saw one page and this story really struck, stuck out on me. I was like, oh, this is some beautiful stuff. And sure enough, I looked at who the artist is, Colleen Duran. Now, uh, if you know her from A Distant Soil or we recently reviewed Neil Gaiman's Snow Glass Apples, you'll know what a fan I am of Duran. Her stuff in Snow Glass Apples is definitely super adult oriented, but this just proves she's capable of drawing really great looking mainstream comics that are appealing to everybody um but particularly to, you know to 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 girls and females like there's this character um who can create flowers and i guess she's been around for a while she has these different botanical flower based abilities but it's just a perfect fit for duran's artwork i thought this was a gem i don't know if it's worth 8.99 it costs for this comic to read just that gem um, because the other stories, like I said, the artwork and stories were of varying quality, not my favorite. Um, th this one was an exception as well. It did have more cheetah stuff, but I thought the artwork was really beautiful. Um, and I forgot who did that. That one was, um, I believe that was, oh yeah, written by Greg Rucka with Nicola Scott. Um, and, 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 and I like Ruck as a writer. He's one of the few male writers in this book, but he's also really well known for his, um, female characters. And just look at this. The artwork is again, really beautiful in this. If you had just taken the Colleen Duran story and this story and put them together in a nice issue, I would have said really awesome anniversary issue. Phil Hester artwork. Uh, okay. Not as much. And the stories, the backup stories in here, not as much either. Um, although this one was interesting with this sort of like uh, uh, Wonder Girls team of these sort of, um, I don't know, historically based Wonder characters. Got a nice backup story in here also by um, Brian Hitch. Brave New World by Scott Snyder with Brian Hitch artwork. While this story was okay, Hitch is up to his usual high quality. Here drawing FDR, um, historical references, and you know not cheating us on the background, spending the time to do it. He has tightened up his style a little bit, so it's not quite quite the level of detail maybe he might have put in, say, The Ultimates way back when, but he's able to put this stuff out on time, and it still looks great. And he's taken the effort to draw great comics. He draws backgrounds and, and 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 say what you want. The camera angles and the design and everything else. Brian Hitch is a winner. 
So, all right, I'm going to give this one a plus. Three of the stories were really top-notch and excellent artwork with uh, good to great story write, uh, writing. Uh, the rest oh, were decent. Is it worth nine? Oh, no, I'm sorry, nine ninety nine. I said eight ninety nine, right? So, was this worth um, nine ninety nine? No. You know, for nine ninety nine, you can get a pretty decent full size graphic novel. In fact, any of those kids graphic novels I showed you in those ads, they're clocking in at like seven ninety nine or something, and you get a bunch of pages, full color. That is a value. This a little bit less so. Uh, and especially if you consider they're trying to sell these decade variant covers. There was like a 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. For 10 bucks each, who's going to buy more than one, let alone all of them? I mean, somebody will, but come on, guys. A little bit greedy, a little bit short-sighted, a little bit chasing the fast buck at the expense of the long buck. But you know, what else is new with DC Comics, right? So somebody just pointed out to me, uh, my friend uh, and comic retailing legend Phil Boyle of Coliseum of Comics in Florida uh, is, is celebrating what he, he said his 37th anniversary or something in comics. And um, but but that it's also the 10 year anniversary of Dan Didio and Jim Lee being the co heads of DC Comics. And I'm just gonna come out and say. There have been some decent comics in those past 10 years, no doubt about it. But where's what's the highlight? I mean, all I can think of is endless reboots and continuity shuffling and trying to get like everything lined up to start telling the perfect stories and just nobody delivering on great storytelling over at DC. And I'm sorry to say I placed this square on the heads of editorial, um, particularly Didio. Who is not only like, so he also writes comics, right? He's writing a Metal Men series right now that I picked up just to look at it. And it was like almost unreadably bad. And it's a 12 issue maxi series of like his favorite childhood characters. Meanwhile, he's also writing like the ads, those Svengoolie ads you might've seen a few months back in those DC comics. So he's writing stuff like that because he loved monster movies and stuff from a kid when he was a kid and whatever. Okay. But he's hopelessly out of touch with like modern storytelling. The thing is with the joke success of the Joker movie right now and then being able to tie like a kind of loose connective thread back to like maybe some of the recent Joker graphic novels and stuff that did come out during their tenure. Uh, you know, they made a billion dollar movie out of the Joker. So like I think his tenure there is probably fairly safe. But I would just like to see you know, and Jim Lee, for that matter, we like him as a creator. I would love to see him, uh, you know, doing books again or covers and stuff more often. Um, but really take an editorial guiding vision and shape the quality. You guys have got the top notch, highest quality artists in the industry at your disposal and many of the best writers. Certainly a solid stable of, of, uh, the second tier writers as well compared to Marvel where they've got one or two decent guys and a bunch of scrubs. Um, you guys have the talent and the team. You, what's lacking is the editorial vision right now. You know, there's villains United happening at the same time as event Leviathan and all these other things that are like events and, and, and the dark multiverse and whatever. These are giant epic events all happening at the same time that don't seem connected to each other. Not to mention the recent reshuffling and getting rid of Vertigo, shuffling around what DC Black Label means and doesn't mean. Guys, who cares about what it means and doesn't mean? Who cares what slots you're putting your comics into? Let's care more about the quality of the comics, right? Let's get the best creative teams that you've got, some editorial guidance to raise the quality. You know, you got Frank Miller on a book. I know you can't only tell Frank Miller so much what to do or Neil Adams what to do, but you got to give them some guidance um, on some of the work because what's coming out is not exciting people. In fact, it's turning them away. Um, you know what is exciting people, folks? Um, th this channel. I've seen a lot of growth. It's slowed a little bit as my output has slowed a little bit. I'm hoping changing up this format and doing longer videos where I digest and talk about more comics and themes and ideas is going to be great. Uh, hopefully that's going to um, 
be something that you're interested in. And if you are, and if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button down there and uh, hit the little bell for notifications if you want to. Um, I've got a lot of stuff planned for 2020. Got some great interviews coming up, including the uh, previously mentioned uh, comics retelling legend Phil Boyle. I'm hoping to get on the show sometimes in tw- sometime in 2020 if his busy schedule allows it. Guy's super busy selling tons and tons of comics and trying to make the industry better. So um, we're gonna s- try and slice off a little bit of time when we've got it and talk to him about you know uh, what can be done to help preserve and strengthen the comics industry and the comic shop culture that's out there anyway i'm rambling a little bit but i'm loving it um i really like this new format uh and but i want to hear what you think let me know if you like it or don't like it do you want me to go back to shorter focused videos on individual comics or how about something a little more like we're doing right now let me know thanks for watching uh thanks for being a part thanks for commenting and uh uh just thanks for being here and, and talking about comics we'll see you next time